Okay, so we've um, just got the minutes past seven now. So uh, what we'll do is we'll get started and I'm sure that other cadets will be joining us as they uh, are able to log in. So I'd just like to introduce uh, Mr. Owens up. Uh, as mentioned in the uh, email and notice that went out, um, Owen is a uh, an airline pilot. He's also done flying in a, a wide variety of uh, environments and uh, has also written several books uh, along the way as well. So uh, without much further ado, I'll hand over to Owen. Thank you. It was probably better on the other screen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us this evening. It's, uh, it's great to chat with you all this, um, what is it, a Sunday night. So, um, yes, as, as Mr. Grit has said, I've got a fairly varied aviation career. And what we're going to do tonight is I'll just step through the different phases of that career. Because I, like you, started when I was 10 years old as a cadet. Um, a junior kid, I should say, in the Australian Air League. And the journey's been somewhat uh, extensive since then. So I'll move through the uh, slides that I've put together for tonight. And probably I think the best idea will be when we get to the end, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you've got. So um, I will now try to work the technology to share the screen. And there we go, slideshow. From beginning. And it's the same screen that Mr. Grinner had initially. Um, as you can see, I started young. I've got a, a little toy airplane there. And some years later, you can see that it's not a toy airplane anymore. That's a Boeing 747, having just landed at Avalon Airport down at Melbourne. Uh, I was actually born into an aviation family. Um, some people in the industry are, some of them aren't. Um, the lady on the top left's my mum. And during World War II, she was a radar operator, which was a top secret job. And as a result, they had to sit at different tables uh, when they were eating. And some of the other female uh, Air Force personnel thought they were bits of snobs because they didn't mix with them, but they're actually told not to. So she worked uh, as a radar operator during the war. Then at the end of the war, they said, we don't need women in the Air Force anymore. So she was let go. Five years later, they thought, oh, we do need women again. So she rejoined the Air Force. And when she got married, they said, we don't want married women. So we've come a long way since then because all opportunities in aviation are open to women as they move through the ranks, which is great. There's no discrimination on, on being married or, or on your gender. So those limitations that sort of hampered her along the way um, no longer exist, but she wouldn't have swapped that time as a radar operator for the world. My father, he joined the Air Force in World War II and trained as navigator. Uh, when they said there was no operational flying over in Europe left to do, he transferred to the Army and he served in New Guinea during World War II as an Army commander. He then went up to Hiroshima just after they dropped the atomic bomb and he was in Japan for nearly two years before he finally got home to Australia. When he did get home to Australia, funnily enough, he joined the Air Force again, but this time he joined as a mechanic. Meanwhile, he was learning to fly at the flying school at Wagga. Kept applying to be an Air Force pilot, but because he'd grown up in a fairly tough time in the 1930s, he hadn't finished school and the Air Force wouldn't have him. Until on the fourth time he applied, his commanding officer wrote a letter and put it in with the form. And he got on pilot's course in the Air Force. So there's a little bit of a lesson there about persistence. He didn't stop trying, even though people were saying, you can't, you can't, he kept going. And what happened was he got selected for fighter training and then he went on to fly 201 combat missions in the Korean War. And that top right picture is uh, the medals that he was awarded during the war. Um, and one there that's on its own. He was actually awarded a couple of years ago. He's passed away, but the US government awarded that to him posthumously or, or after he's passed away. Down below is a photo of him getting a medal actually up in Korea in the tent there very, very exotic uh, accommodation they had during the war. And then there's another photo of him there sitting in his jet fighter, just about to unstrap, having completed a mission. So yes, I was born into aviation. Um, as long as I can remember, I was around aeroplanes. Very good photo there on the uh, left-hand side of me with my father. Funnily enough, that was the type of jet he flew in the Korean War, a Gloucester Meteor. And that wasn't very far from my home. And it wasn't very far from my Parramatta squadron of the Air League. And one day we decided to go up and uh, 
have our photo taken in front of it. I remember getting in trouble because I had my hands in my pockets. Um, I get in trouble now for my kids because of the haircut. But we went and stood in front of the Gloucester Medial and it was one that he'd flown. Uh, top right there is him walking back after a mission, uh, actually back here in Australia and down the bottom with my sister and my mum in his Qantas uniform. Because after he left the Air Force, he flew for Qantas. He flew for Airlines of New South Wales. He towed targets in Mustang fighters. He flew corporate aircraft. But the best job he ever had outside of the Air Force, he said his last 10 or 15 years was flying the air ambulance aircraft where he'd fly out in the middle of the night on his own and retrieve people who were sick and injured and bring them back to hospital. He thought that was a really satisfying job. So when people think of aviation careers, they always think of airlines, but there's a lot more to it. And there's a lot of satisfaction to be gained in jobs other than that. And he used to take me along on some of those flights. We had to pull the curtain across so the nurses wouldn't see. But I used to sit up the front of the air ambulance uh, sometimes before I even went to school. So it was a, a pretty cool upbringing for a young kid who loved aeroplanes. Taking flight myself, um, as I said, as long as I can remember, I wanted to fly. So I, um, I can remember wanting to go into the dentist and mum giving me a notebook and I used to draw pictures of aeroplanes even then. The aeroplane down the bottom left is MAW and that was with the Scouts Air Activities at Camden. So you may have even seen it from time to time. I don't think it's there now. But that's the aircraft I went first solo in. The Air Force gave me a scholarship. They paid for um, eight hours of flying and I went out and I went solo in a Cessna 152. So I, the bug to fly bit me pretty early because I didn't have a driver's license then. Um, I, my high school, I'd left the Air League because at my high school they had Air Training Corps Squadron and I went up through the ranks there and that's, that's how I got the scholarship to fly. When I left school, I joined the ambulance service. That's why I've got an ambulance there and I was a paramedic. And so I used my wages from the ambulance service to pay for flying lessons. I was very lucky though, because I didn't have to pay full price because I didn't have to pay for an instructor. I had a dad who could do that. So we used to hire an aeroplane and he would be my instructor. I'd have a really long briefing during the week, a little one just before the flight, and then a really long one afterwards. And he wasn't really good at telling me when I did well. He'd tell mum. And mum would say, oh, your dad said you did well today. But he was pretty good at pointing out when I'd made mistakes. And that aircraft at the top right is one that he taught me in a lot. And you might have even seen that because that's in the Air League hangar at Camden now. For those of you who have been out to the Air Activities Base, that's Delta X-Ray Foxtrot. And I've probably got nearly all of my private license training in that very aeroplane. And the gentleman out there, when I saw him, has been kind enough to say, you can come for a fly one day in it. So I think I might have to reunite with that aeroplane. So I got my license. Then I got an instructor rating. And the black and white photos of, is of the little... Piper Tomahawk that I was allocated to teach people to fly in. And I did that for about a year. And then I got a job in the Kimberley region up in Northwest Australia. It was very remote and I lived in a caravan and I loved it. And one of those photos there is at a remote community where I've just landed on the dirt strip and we're unloading freight. Um, beside that is me striking rather strange pose in front of my favorite airplane, the Cessna 310. Um, and I used to fly that between the top end and Perth. It was eight hours flying in a day, sleep in the hotel, fly back again. So it was a good way to get your hours up, when, which is what you're trying to do as a young pilot. And I think the aircraft down the bottom you've had in some of your GP books, that's a Cessna 337. And if I could ask you, I'd say, what's unusual about that? It's got an engine at the front and an engine at the back. And one of the fun games was you could actually stop the engine at the front and fly along on the back engine. And people found that rather disconcerting that they could be flying along with the propeller stopped in front of them. I used to like it, that was good fun. I came back to Bankstown then, and I got a job as a chief pilot and a chief flying instructor. So I was in charge of charter operations where we just flew here, there and everywhere with everyone from lawyers to miners to people who just wanted to go for a flight over the harbour to teaching people to fly from their first lesson right through to getting their commercial license and learning to fly twin engine aeroplanes. Uh, CASA or Civil Aviation Safety Authority at that time introduced a system where they 
delegated the issue of license to certain chief pilots and chief flying instructors. Whereas once upon a time, you had to do the test with, with a CASA flight examiner. And I was lucky enough to be on the first group of those um, independent test officers or approved test officers. So I wasn't just teaching, I was actually um, testing people for their licenses and renewing their ratings. And it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun, because you got to have a lot of input and you got to see how people improved. And one of the key things is the people who improved the most were the ones who tried. They weren't necessarily the top guns and the stars. It was the ones who did the homework and went home and tried. And once again, like with my dad, it's that persistence that tended to count. Uh, and the one down the bottom, I thought I left that one out, but it, it, that's just when I had a, a little mishap and I had to make a landing away from the airfield and it all turned out well. But uh, as you can see, the wing got a bit bent. It's flying again, that aeroplane anyway. And I went to some interesting places. People used to um, have to have aeroplanes delivered uh, outside of Australia. Up the top, the white aircraft in the top right hand corner, you're looking in the back cargo door there of a Britain Norman Islander. Two engines, built to take about eight passengers or so. But what you can see through that door is fuel tanks. I just had all these big tanks installed so I could stay in the air if I had to for about 15 hours, which is a bit like the 747, but a lot slower. And I did a flight up to Micronesia, up near Guam in the Pacific. And I did it in three hops of eight hours. I flew from Bankstown to the top of Australia, up near uh, Townsville. The next day I went to Manus Island on the other side of New Guinea, which hits in the news a lot now, but I couldn't get over New Guinea. I couldn't fly high enough. So I had to go around New Guinea. Uh, and then I slept in the aeroplane that night because the people who refueled me looked like the sort that had come back and take the fuel away again. So I had to guard my aeroplane all night. And then the next day I flew eight hours over the Pacific all before GPS uh, flying on a compass and found a little island called Yap Island. And that was fantastic. The photo below is me standing on a Japanese Zero because it had been a base during World War II and there were still Japanese Zeros out in the paddock. Some had been taken by modern Japanese uh, people to put in museums, but there were still those relics there. And I had a great time climbing over all these old warbirds. On the left-hand side is when I was up in New Guinea. Once again, I had to deliver an aeroplane to New Guinea. And when I got up there, they wanted me to fly it around for them for some weeks. So I'm sitting at a B-25 Mitchell that was on display there. And down the bottom, you can see that I've pulled up at one of the native strips. And uh, from memory, I was flying politicians around that day. And they were big boys and it, it really noticed it in the climb out performance because it was a really hot day too. Um, so yeah, outside of just flying around Bankstown, even though I was a charter pilot and chief flying instructor, I got some pretty good jobs as well, delivering aeroplanes to some really exotic places. Oh, and one other thing at Bankstown, I actually met this girl um, who I'm now married to for 23 years. And you guessed it, she's a pilot too. Um, she flies for Qantas. In fact, she got into Qantas before me. And the flight down the bottom of the Qantas 767, she was the pilot on the very last 767 flight. And that's it passing over Sydney. They got to do some figure eights over Sydney Harbour with air traffic control approval. And then over on the left is all of the family in the cockpit of a 747, which we did on an open day at Qantas probably about six months ago. So that's my family. Um, but yeah, working at Bankstown didn't just get me flying hours, it also got me the girl I ended up marrying. I left Bankstown and I scored an airline job. That was fantastic. I was actually going to fly a jet. And I got posted onto the Boeing 737 and you can see the black and white photo of the 300 model of the 73. And it was a great aeroplane. You can see from the cockpit shot below it, it had a mix of the TV screens or ethos and the old round dials as well. So for a pilot who was moving onto an advanced type of aeroplane, it was great because I was used to round dials so I could fly off those, but I gradually got to learn how to fly the, the ethos or the electronics, which you're all probably used to these days. Um, in fact, I remember I was still flying, I, I think probably nearly two years, I was still looking at the old dials until I came back from holidays one week and I 
I just changed. I don't even remember how or why, but it was a fantastic little aeroplane. Um, it was very sporty. There's a lot of models of the 737. I've flown the 300, the 400 and the 800. And the 300 was the sportiest, no two ways about it. It was good fun to fly. And that's my rather old and battered hat sitting there, which is also a bit of a treasure. So for a, I was in my tw late twenties then, and to get an airline job was just fantastic. And back in those days, you thought it's a job for life. However, unfortunately, Ansett went broke and we all lost our jobs. So I got a job back at Bankstown teaching ground school to uh, student pilots straight away. And I also got a job coaching cricket at the Bradman Foundation. So I, I wasn't out of work. I was just not flying jets. And then luckily, Qantas gave me a job about three or four months later. And I've been at Qantas since January 2002. So I've been there over 18 years now. And what we've got there is uh, the bottom right is just before I went to the Antarctic one day, I took a photo of a, a 747 landing. Above that is the cockpit. And just as the sun's coming up, I think I was south of Honolulu at that time, heading over for um, San Francisco. No prizes for guessing what the white stuff is, that's snow. And that's on an Antarctic charter where we, we don't land down there, but we go down and back and it's about a 13 hour day. And then the one below it is, I was once again, very fortunate. That's a brand new 737-800 that Qantas bought. And I flew over to Seattle and we brought that home empty and brand new. And we just landed at Hawaii and we took it from the Boeing factory. And when we signed on that morning to get the aircraft, they gave us all the paperwork for, for the brand new aeroplane for Qantas. And they gave us two big eskies full of lobsters and prawns. So when we got to um, Hawaii, we had a feast. We didn't need them on board, but it was a, a fantastic trip. We came back via Fiji and then Melbourne, and we left the aeroplane in Melbourne because it had to have um, certification done. Because I lost my job, I wanted to do some other things, and I wrote some books, and I did a master's degree, and that's where the writing started. And I've been lucky enough now to write about 400 articles and eight books taken me to amazing places, the riding and the flying, the top ones up on a glacier lake in Canada, the Antarctica, the Imperial Palace in Japan is there, the little bridge. And then the big bridge is the Golden Gate in San Francisco. And that is in a helicopter and we were just about to fly under the bridge. It was all legal, uh, but it was a beautiful day and we flew right under the Golden Gate Bridge and back over the top. I got some good photos of that, but I wasn't quite quick enough to get the video. Uh, the magazines asked me to test fly aeroplanes, so I've flown things from the Mustang to that pusher that looks like a boomerang called a Cozy, and business jets like the Citation Latitude at the top. So more riding, more aircraft. Even though I've got a job flying airliners, I love everything that goes along with it. More aircraft, that's a little Piper Tomahawk, Red Boeing Stearman. The uh, yellow winged aeroplane is a World War II trainer called the Harvard, that's a Navy one, called an SNJ. But the interesting thing there was I flew that over Pearl Harbor, which was very significant in World War II. So I thought I've got to fly a World War II airplane over there. And the business jets are Citation 10, which nearly goes the speed of sound, goes at uh, 0.91 mark, very fast. King Air, so I, uh, Cessna Caravan, that's the cockpit of an F-18 simulator, which I was lucky enough to fly. And I even flew a hot air balloon. So for someone who loves flying, it's pretty good. That's, I was the first non-military person to fly the PC-21 for the Air Force. And I've been fortunate to fly about 100 different types of aeroplanes. So for the little kid who used to draw pictures before he went in to see the dentist, it's pretty much a dream job. I did a solo flight for charity, raising money for the flying doctor. And that's the map of where I went around Australia. And uh, that took me about 15 days of flying over probably about three weeks and fantastic. I wrote a book about it, Solo Flight, and uh, it's a trip I'll never forget. The media were very good. I think I ended up doing about 150 pieces of media for newspapers and TVs and that, but we raised a lot of money for the flying doctor service, which was the main thing. And then a few years later, they got me to fly a reenactment of the first airmail flight from Melbourne to Sydney which once again was very interesting. Uh, 
one thing at a village called Harden, which you might drive through sometimes coming out of uh, the Southern Highlands or out of Sydney, there was a circle of concrete in a paddock. And what it was when we cleared the grass away, back when in 1914, when the first flight happened, they poured a circle of concrete and painted it white. So that very first air mail flight could work out where to land. And it's still there, sort of in someone's backyard. I did three years at Jetstar as a captain. So having flown Boeings my whole career, I flew Airbus, A320 and 321. And then I came back to Qantas, where I've been until the pandemic hit. And now this office where I'm sitting is pretty much my cockpit the last few weeks. And I've been busy writing more books and articles. So, there's some of my pilot's wings. Not all of them, I couldn't find them all for the photo. And they're my logbooks. I think I've got eight or nine or 10 logbooks. And they're some of the different sets of wings I've worn over the years. So I've had a great time. I've had about 20, 000, over 20,000 hours of flying time. I've flown around 100 different types of aeroplane. And I just, even though I lost my job when Ansett uh, Airlines collapsed, and that it's been a really enjoyable journey. And I think if there was one thing I was to say, anyone can do it if they work hard enough. It's not the top guns, it's not the aces. If you're sitting there thinking you'd like to do it, I think start now, head down, get into the books and you'll be right. And hopefully there's still more to come. So that's 20,000 hours in about 20 minutes. I hope that, uh, <laughs> I hope you found that informative. And uh, look, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to take any questions if there's any there. Okay, well, we've got a few questions. So what I might do is I might actually uh, bring the cadets up, up to, to ask them themselves. Sounds uh, good. That always works really well. Yep. Um, so as I mentioned, if you've got questions, just pop them into the Q&A. And if you see a question there that you'd like to ask too, or that you, you're really interested in knowing the answer, if you can upvote that one, that way we can make sure that we get to the... Uh, to those ones uh, first. So the first person I'll bring up is John Hickman and John's from Parramatta Squadron and he's got a question for Owen. So uh, over to you, John. Uh, you're just on mute at the moment, John. There you go. Hello, uh, John. Hello. How are you, John? Good. Excellent, okay. And your question for uh, Mr. Zup? Um, yes, um, do you prefer general aviation or commercial? Um, I enjoy commercial airline flying to pay my mortgage and put my kids through school. And I still enjoy the airline flying, but I've always maintained a love of general aviation. I've owned light aeroplanes. I've owned a Piper Tomahawk and a Tiger Moth. Um, and I've kept my grade one instructor rating now for, I don't know, 30 years. So I love them both. Slightly different environments though, in the airlines, very controlled, very regimented, which is the job. And I, as a job goes, 10 out of 10. But I also enjoy that freedom of, of being on my own in a light aircraft. So it's a bit of a wishy-washy answer. I, I love them both for what they do in their own right. But my, my sort of recommendation a lot of the time is do that for a job and you can generally afford to go and fly GA on the side. Also, um, do you know Mr. Roby? Uh, Keith Roby, uh, who was the founder of the Air League, I knew. And his son, um, oh, is it Peter Roby? Uh, yeah, I, I know his son as well. His son flew for Ansett prior to 1989. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, Mr. Roby from um, Parramatta Squadron. Yeah, the name rings a bell. Um, I knew the founder of the Air League, uh, well, George Roby and his son. But um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I, I do recall a Roby out at um, Parramatta Squadron. He'd be fairly senior now, wouldn't he? Um, yes, yeah. the highest rank in my squadron. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he was there when I was there. I'm pretty sure I've. He might have even signed one of my certificates. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you, John. All right. We've also got uh, Zaina. Uh, Zane, would you like to ask your question? Uh, what is your favourite aircraft? I knew that one was coming. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a really wishy-washy answer for that. Probably the most enjoyable aircraft I flew or the most enjoyable flight was um, flying a Mustang aircraft, which was a World War II fighter. I had to go in a dual control one. But a bit of that was because it was my dad's favourite aeroplane too. And I'd grown up with all these amazing tales of what he'd done in the Mustang. And, and to get in that aircraft 
knowing how special it was to him, I think as much as the aeroplane's performance, there was something sentimental and even a little emotional there. So if I had to pick the most amazing flight, I'd probably say the P-51 Mustang. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Zane. And we've also got Blake. Uh, what squadron are you from, Blake? I'm Hello, from Gawler. Uh, Gawler in South Australia. Thank you. And what was your question for Mr. Zapp? Have you ever had any engine failures? Engine failures? Was that, have I had an engine failure? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I had one. That was the what photo with the yeah. bent wing and I, I just landed away from an airfield and that was all okay. Um, and the other ones I've had, one was in a, a Boeing with a big jet, so it wasn't an issue. And the other one was just in a, um, I've had a couple in, along the way, but, but nothing that really caused you to raise much of a sweat. It was, um, you get trained along the way to, to deal with those things. But yes, I've had engines fail on me. It's not a good day at the office, but, but you manage. Okay, thank you, Blake. Um, we've also got uh, Christian. I think it's actually Isaac. Isaac, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. That's good, Isaac. And what was your question for Mr. Zup? Um, where was the F-18 simulator located? That was up at Williamtown Air Base. And uh, one of the senior instructors was someone I taught to fly many years before. So, I actually uh, used to live at Williamtown, like close to it. I okay. used to live my, my, close to the rough base. Yeah, my parents used to too until um, hit my dad left the Air Force. But yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you, uh, Isaac. Uh, we've also got uh, Aiden on. Uh, what squadron would you be from, Aiden? I'm from Harvey Squadron. Harvey Bay in Queensland. Yep. Okay, and what was your question for Mr. Zup? Um, I've got. Uh, I see you've got a few. Maybe we'll just go for the, the most uh, pressing one that you can think of at the moment. Uh, uh, which one was it? Have you ever done fuel dumping? Yes, once. Once in a 747 out of um, Melbourne, just before Christmas. We took out of, off out of Melbourne for Los Angeles and we had to shut, I think it was number three engine down on a 747. And uh, we called up to fuel dump and it was when the big bushfires were on. Uh -huh. They said, you want to do what? <laughs> but, so they sent us out over the ocean to do that. Mind you, it all vaporizes basically before it gets down to ground level anyway. And I thought I was going to get Christmas off because I didn't think they'd find another flight for me, but they found another aeroplane. So I've, I've done fuel dumping once out of Melbourne heading for uh, Los Angeles. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks, Aidan. Uh, if we get time, I see you've got a couple of other questions, so we might get you up. Uh, we've now got Jai from um, Tamworth, I believe. Hello. Hello, Jai. And what was your question for Hello. Mr. Zup? Um, how old were you when you went solo? I was... Uh, I was... Seven, I just think, 81. I... It was just on my 17th birthday, I think it was. I was in year 11. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. um, you, uh, you weren't allowed to in those days. There was no RAOs. So it was pretty much about as young as you. Now, can you, you can hear, hear it? it? Yeah. You can hear it. Yeah. Nice. All right. Great. Thank you, Jai. Just having a look for a few more. We've got Reese here. Reese is, is, is the most popular question, even though he hasn't really asked much, but we might bring up Reese anyway, see if you've got a question. Okay, Reese, how are you? Good, how are you, sir? Uh, good, and what squadron are you from, Reese? Southern Highlands. Oh, okay, and uh, so I guess Mr. Zup would be no stranger to you. And what was your question for Mr. Zup? Um, how old were you when you flew the P-51? Um, good question. Why? We were just about to have our first daughter and she turned 17 the other day. So I would have been about 38 or 39, I guess. Late 30s. Looked like I was about, you know, 20. But uh, yeah, I would have been in my late 30s when I flew All the right. Mustang. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. No worries, Reese. Reese. Um, Luke is asking, I would love to become an astronaut. What's your advice? I guess actually, we all have to be an astronaut at one time, so we might not just actually bring Luke up. Yeah. Hello. 
Hello, Luke. How are you? And what squadron are you from? Um, I am from Sutherland Shire Squadron. Okay. Um, uh, so your question was about an, uh, wanting to be an astronaut. So I'll, I'll let you ask it. Um, what, um, if I want to become an astronaut, what is the best advice? I could yeah, have? It, th th that's a really growing industry. Obviously, um, military aviation has some links, but I was actually speaking to someone the other day whose daughter is, um, potentially going over to the United States and possibly going into the astronaut program. She did her HSC about a year ago. And I think the thing probably more than anything to think of is that um, space missions have mission specialists. So it's not just being a pilot. Um, the, the chaps from Australia who've been astronauts already have been scientists. So I think probably the best advice is to think in what capacity you'd like to go into space. Would it be in an engineering capacity or would it be studying sciences or physiological? They, they look at the, the effect of weightlessness on bodies. So maybe you go into medicine or most of the pilots are actually United States Air Force chaps. So, um, or United States services, I should say. So I think probably the first thing is to think what role would you like to perform if you went into space? Would it be something medically related or engineering or science related? Um, or being fly and then and then go from there and make sure you get the, the best marks you can in those fields because it's very competitive. Um, the girl I know that's gone to America, um, she was in the sciences. She was looking at being a mission specialist in science. Uh, another little side trap is they have space camp over there. And uh, I've been know, there. Have you? Yeah, I know yeah, someone. Who I attended that back in 2018 and it was a really great experience and I'll never forget it. Yeah, well, you know what? I would email them. They'd probably have a better idea than me. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's that uh, a chap I know, his kids have been, there's three stages or whatever, and they've done the basic intermediate and advanced or something. But they said the same thing. Wonderful experience. So they'd be the people to ask, I reckon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Luke. Um, there's also a couple of books which I might pop online um, just on Facebook. Uh, for example, uh, Chris Hadfield was uh, the Canadian... Uh, astronaut you might have seen playing a David Bowie song on, on the International Space Station but he's written a book about his journey from being a young boy watching the, the moon landings to being an astronaut and while he's Canadian it gives you some of the advice on you know the, the, the sort of focus and, and, and determination that he had. All right uh, we've got uh, Adam. Adam uh, what squadron are you from? Uh, Sutherland Shire. Okay and what was your question for Mr Zup? Uh, uh, what's the uh, best advice for landing in a general aviation aircraft? Just like the landing, say. yeah, I, I'd say probably the um, like the, it's such a, a multifaceted thing landing the airplane. It's where science meets the art, really. You've got to be on the numbers and on the center line, and then you do have to have a degree of feel. I could probably highlight the most common issue I, I see is people tensing up, getting the white knuckles, and they lose that feel in the flare, so they they tend to pull back too rigidly and and fly away. And that, if you compound it with not being on the correct speed. If you're too slow, you tend to fall into the flare. And if you're too fast, when you tense up. So I think if you, um, the, the key to a good landing is a good approach. So if you just have that cycle of activity as you're coming into land, that you're looking at the aim point, the slope and the center line and speed, and you just keep checking those the whole way down. And then as you come over the keys, look to the far end, and reduce the power and think, I don't want to land, I don't want to land, I don't want to land, as you're pulling back. Um, because the most often I see people, generally speaking, um, have repeating issues is when they're not on speed or if they're, they're too tense and they can't really feel the aeroplane. But it's a really general thing. You normally, if you see one or two landings where it goes awry, as an instructor, you can troubleshoot it. But if I was to say, they're probably the two most common things. So cycle of activity as you come into land, be on speed and don't tense up. It's probably yep. uh, the simplest way to go. Yeah. And uh, thanks for donating your books for Air League. They're a great read as well. No worries at all. I'm glad you liked it. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, thank you, Adam. We've also got Jimmy. Uh, what squadron are you from, Jimmy? Uh, I'm from Roville Squadron. Sorry? Um, Merrickville Squadron. Uh, Merrickville. Okay, and your question was? Um, have you ever flown in a fighter jet? 
Um, no, the closest I've done is the PC-21, uh, which was the new Air Force two-seat turboprop trainer. But no, I haven't done a jet. I wouldn't rule it out in the future. Um, the F-18 was, was looking like there was a possibility there and then they retired them. But uh, I haven't to date, no, but it is on the, um, put it, let's call it the bucket list. We'll call it a bucket list item. I would love to do it and, and I wouldn't rule it out. Okay, thank you, Jimmy. Uh, we've also got uh, Emmett. Uh, what squadron are you from, Emmett? I am from the Harvey Bay Squadron. Okay. And my no. question is, and my question is, would you like, sorry, which plane would you recommend? Airbus A320 or Boeing 737? Oh, gee, that, that's, I get asked that all the time. I love the 737 because it was my first jet. Um, the Airbus is an easier aircraft probably to fly. It, it's a little bit more difficult to manage the checklist. I always say, if Boeing and Airbus got together and built an aeroplane together, it'd be fantastic. I think my heart is probably with the 737, to be honest. I, I'm glad I flew the Airbus because most people who say the Airbus is no good has never flown them. Most people say Boeing's never good. No good has never flown. So I would say I'd probably put the 737 ahead of the Airbus, the 737-800, but the Airbus is, is a, a a very good aircraft to fly to, but I lean towards the, uh, <laughs> I lean towards the uh, Boeing, I think. We'll pop up a little poll here, see what everybody thinks. What, what's everyone's favorite? Seems we've got a Boeing crowd tonight. <laughs> okay, thanks Emmett. We've also got uh, Dean, and what squadron are you from, Dean? Uh, Manly. Okay, from Manly, the first squadron. And what was your question for Mr. Zup? I was just wondering what subjects would I need to study to be a commercial pilot? Um, look, they're changing all the time. Uh, when I was at school, it was, you must do maths, physics and English. But depending on the demand and how many pilots they need, they've definitely relaxed physics. Uh, I would say do a good standard of maths and a good standard of English is the core. Um, obviously check with your school counsellor as to what they recommend with the latest uh, information. But practically speaking, being able to do mental arithmetic in your head and being able to write a coherent report or entry into the maintenance log are the two practical skills. So I'd say focus on your maths and English and uh, check with your school uh, vocational officer because the Air Force may require physics. Uh, Qantas don't at the moment, I don't think, but that could change again. But emphasis on maths and English, I would say. Thank you. Okay, no worries. Team. And we've also got Barry. Uh, what back squadron are you from, Barry? There you go. Hello, Hello Barry, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks, Brian. Hey, g'day, Alan. Uh, I'm from Belmont, New South Wales squadron. Um, yeah. Just wondering, Ultralights and microlights, you've flown any of them? Um, I haven't done, no, I haven't done in the actual microlight category. Um, and trikes are one thing I sort of keep away from because they work in the opposite sense. And I tend to think yeah. if something went wrong, I'd push the wrong way. Um, and there's a number of airline guys that have sort of got caught out with that. They've, it's gone quite after takeoff and they've pushed the nose down and that's stalled it. So, um, no, I haven't had much, probably the lightest thing I've flown as sort of the Jabiru class aeroplanes. Um, Jabiru, some of the Technams, uh, Brumby, that sort of thing. But no, I haven't gone into the microlights. Yeah, okay, thanks for that. No worries. Thanks, Brian. Okay, we've also got Paul. Uh, what squadron are you from, Paul? Hi, Owen, thanks for your time tonight. I'm from no squadron in South Australia. Um, I just wondered if you'd done any reminiscing and visited the uh, ANSET Museum in Victoria in Hamilton as you used to work for ANSET. I have actually. When I did that solo flight around Australia, that was a, a, an intentional um, waypoint that I stopped and I went and visited the, the ANSET Museum at Hamilton. Um, I'd spent the night, I think, at Adelaide and I hopped across to Hamilton and I'm trying to think where I went next. I might have even gone to Launceston that day. Um, but yeah, it was fascinating to see. And they had 
Reg's old leather chair there and a few other things. But no, it, it's a very, it's not very well known, is it? But uh, no, no. Si similar to uh, in Minlerton in South Australia, I went and saw the um, red aircraft that did the airmail flight across from Melbourne. And there's a lot of these tucked in corners around Australia. And I think the Ansett Museum is one of those. So that's, that's a really good question. Brilliant. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, we've got uh, Dominic. What squadron are you from, Dominic? Tari. Tari. Okay, yes. and uh, what was your question for Mr. Zup? Have you ever had to crash land? No, I've had to make a controlled landing away from an airport um, when yeah. I had difficulties with the aeroplane, but um, touch wood, no, I, I haven't had to crash land an aeroplane. Uh, okay. If you've crash landed it, you've probably got it wrong. <laughs> but um, you're trained that if something, if you have a partial or a full power loss, how to fly the aircraft to the ground. And you should, if you're in a single engine airplane, generally navigate all the way where you've got places to land as an option. So um, crash land, no, I, I have had to land away from the airport. Um, yeah. And I did have one time when the undercarriage wasn't working and I had to land with only with the wheels not locking. They were extended, but they didn't lock. Um, okay. And the girl that's now my wife took some photos of me skidding along as I touched down. But nothing that I'd say was particularly horrendous. No, nothing that I, I'd determine as a crash. Yeah. Thank, and and thank don't you. wish it upon me. No, no. <laughs> Thanks, Dominic. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dominic. All right. Um, okay. We've got somebody here might be familiar to you. He has a question as well. Uh, here we okay. go. Over to you, Hayden. Um, my question is, what, in your opinion, what do you think the ugliest plane is and the best looking plane is? Well, you know, my answer to the, the ugliest is the, would you like to answer that question for me, Hayden? It's oh, the, I think he's frozen, I, man. I, yeah, I must admit, the um, I'm not a, a huge admirer of the Gaff Nomad. <laughs> um, uh, my father used to say to me, if I ask you to go and draw an aeroplane and you draw a Nomad, um, I'll ask you to go and do it again. <laughs> um, the best looking aeroplane, gee, I reckon the Mustang goes close again. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, um, it's a bit of a toss up. I probably... I'm not too fond of the Nomad, um, but I think the uh, Mustang's probably the nicest looking one. Oh, he's back again, is he? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You froze there. So what did you think the answer to the, the worst looking aeroplane was? Uh, probably the Gaff Nomad. There you go. Okay. You're a mind reader. <laughs> also, I left after you said the ugliest. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you for your question, Hayden. Okay. Thank you, Hayden. All right. We've got Joshua. Uh, what squadron are you from, Joshua? Uh, I think you're on mute there still, Joshua. Um, Gosford Squadron. Uh, from Gosford Squadron. And what was the question that you had for Mr. Zapp? Is it an advantage going to an aviation high school? Was that, is it an advantage going to an aviation high school? Uh, that's the one, yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, oh, I would have loved to have done it. I know when they started the one at Bankstown Grammar when I was there, I was, oh, Gee, all those subjects I had to sit through painfully. Imagine if I had to do aeronautics and that. Um, I don't think it's necessarily an advantage. And the fact that you're um, involved with the Air League straight away shows that you've got enthusiasm beyond school time, which takes an extra level of dedication, to be honest. Um, but I think it'd be fantastic. I think it'd be wonderful to go to an aviation school. But at the end of the day, um, you get the results based on what you do. and and not many people go to aviation schools and there's still a lot of pilots out there. So uh, once again, the fact that you're involved with the Air League shows that outside of school hours, you're making a commitment. So if I was a chief pilot looking for a pilot, I'd say this guy's committed. Whereas there's possibly some people at an aviation high school who aren't necessarily, it's just a, a convenient subject. Not all of them, obviously, but it would be a wonderful opportunity, but I don't think you'll be disadvantaged if you don't go to one, if you work hard. No worries, Joshua. Okay, thank you, Joshua. 
Um, now we've got a few who have asked uh, multiple questions, so we might just bring Jai up. Jai has a, a question about training costs. Mm -hmm. Welcome back, Jai. Hello again. Um, how much would um, flight training costs, like how much did it cost for you? Oh, gee, <laughs> it's a little bit different when I learned to fly. I, I think they were hiring out a, a Piper Tomahawk for $47 an hour. I think I've got a receipt somewhere. And I, I think now they're 235 or so dollars an hour to hire. So the dual rate is um, probably, you know, somewhat more than that. Uh, I guess in terms of the cadet ships that they have through some of the airline schemes that at the end of it give you an Airbus endorsement or something, I've seen those go as high as sort of $160,000. Oh, I man. think, uh, pr yeah, probably the, the most economic way outside of obviously joining the Defence Force um, is to just multiply that $235 an hour by how many hours uh, you anticipate flight training and then you'll have to pay more as you go into more complex types as well. Um, one advice I, I say to people in terms to save money though, well, two pieces of advice. One, always keep your theory subjects ahead of your flying because A, yeah. you'll understand better what you're doing in the air and B, you won't get to a stage where you go, oh, I can't start my navigation training because I don't have the subject because then you'll spend time catching up and getting up to speed again. So always keep yeah. your, your, your theory ahead of your um, uh, flying. And the other thing I say to people is um, it, fly effectively the lowest category of aeroplane that you have to fly legally to do the training. I did a lot of hours uh, getting my hours up for my commercial license solo on a little Tomahawk or something similar. By that stage, my training was all on retractable high speed aeroplanes. But it didn't matter. It just was a matter of hours. So I saved a lot of money hiring that versus a more advanced type. So unless you're required to be flying the advanced type, do whatever gets you your hours cheapest. And then as you approach, oh, I'm coming up to, to do my test. Well, yes, obviously consolidate on the higher performance aeroplane. But yeah. people will sometimes try and make you think that you always have to be flying the more expensive aeroplane. And there's certain phases of your training you don't. So just keep an eye on that, but always keep your theory ahead of your flying. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Jai. Thanks, Jai. Uh, we've also got Jimmy back. Jimmy had a, another question here. Uh, over to you, Jimmy. Um, what was the first aircraft you did a solo in? Uh, it was a Cessna 152 and the registration was VHMAW and um, I can remember that flight like it was yesterday. I, it, uh, it's perfectly clear. And we didn't have headphones in those days. Um, so the radio came through the overhead speaker. And I'm sure Mr. Grinner probably remembers these days too. And a handheld microphone. So you're concentrating coming into land and Camden Towers says clear to land. Then you've got to reach down, get the microphone. And um, it, it, it seemed busy, but it was, uh, it was an amazing experience. I, I, in 20,000 hours, I still haven't forgotten that day. So it was a Cessna 152 to answer the original question. Hey, thanks. Okay, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, we've also got Liam. Uh, Liam, what squadron are you from? Uh, I'm from Epping. Epping. In SW. Yeah, and what was your question for Mr. Zup? Uh, is um, Qantas going to phase out the 747s because of their retirement? <laughs> yes, they're being very coy about that, but um, Oscar Echo Echo, I think it is, leaves on Tuesday to go to Los Angeles and then the Mojave Desert where they will park it. And Oscar Echo Juliet, our last 747, is leaving on June 30. So I can't see that they'll bring them back from the Mojave Desert. Um, when they did have buyers lined up to buy the aeroplane at the start of next year, I'm afraid that I think June 30 will be the last time you see a Qantas 747 um, in the skies over Australia. It's a bit of a sad day after all these years, but uh, time moves on. But to answer your question, I think they will be retired. The last flight's June 30th. Yeah. Sad, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. My to see something from 1969 to go. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Some of us could remember that. 
Yeah, my, my secret confession is I've never actually ridden in a 747. Um, oh. My flight's always been like an Airbus or a smaller aircraft or an A380s. Uh, well, I like yeah. get on that They're flight. a very, very stable aircraft to fly. Very yeah. stable. Yeah. All okay, right. thank you very much, Owen. No worries at all, Liam. Thank you. Okay, if anybody else has got any questions, just uh, pop your hand up or pop your question in the, the Q&A. Um, this is probably the first time we've actually got all of our questions here. We've got... Uh, Paul has another question that looks for us. Owen, um, can you still hear me? Uh, yep. Yes, I can, Paul. Yes, hi, Owen. Um, your first aircraft that you did a load of your flight training in, um, Delta Echo Fox, was that a PA-28? Yeah, Delta X-ray Foxtrot it is. Yes, it's a PA-28, 140 horsepower, a very early model one that has the trim as a, a windshield wiper up on the roof. Yes, yeah. Yes. I've got about 80 hours in a PA-28, and I think Mr. Grimper can share some stories as well about PA-28 flying as well, I reckon. Yeah, I've yeah. done a few hours now down in uh, Uniform November Lima down at, uh, at uh, Air Activities and uh, done a few flights and uh, yeah. a few Victor ones and a, a trip up to visit Barry there at um, yeah. uh, Central Coast uh, up at uh, Lake Macquarie. So thanks very much, uh, Paul. Yeah, it is a very popular... Uh, popular light aircraft. In fact, uh, for our classes the other night, I had one here on my desk as well. That's awesome. Well done, guys. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, we, we've got uh, Lincoln. Uh, what squadron are you from, Lincoln? I'm from Nidri. Hello, Lincoln. And what was your question for Mr. Zuck? Do you think Qantas will ever use the Boeing Sugar? The Boeing Sugar? Not familiar with that one. What, what, what's that uh, project about? As it's I a, the Google it. <laughs> a electric, it's a new electric plane, like an airliner, a new electric one. Um, well, with the electric, uh, everything there is just de de developmental. I did a story a uh, few years back with Airbus on electric flight. And um, unfortunately, they're a long way off the battery technology at the moment. So... I wouldn't think any airlines considering um, electric flight just at the moment in an airline capacity. The closest they're getting is there's a one four, a British Aerospace 146 out of uh, Europe at the moment. And they're currently trialing, it's a four engine aircraft. One of the engines is electric powered. So um, they're, look, they're going to aim for with those, I believe a hybrid, just like you have a hybrid car, they'll get up and going and then they'll, They'll use the two um, electrically driven ones, but still have two traditional motors. But I think an all electric aircraft is um, a long way off. They do have some very interesting plans though. I went over to the Airbus factory um, some years ago, but one of the technologies, not just Airbus are looking at is having um, uh, heat sensors in the seat and using body heat to run the internal lighting in an airliner. So there's all, or supplement the power. So there's a lot of, a lot of advances being made, but I don't think anyone's really looking at uh, electric airliners just yet. Maybe some hybrids in a little while, but yeah, for the moment, I think, I think they the said they were releasing the Boeing Sugar in 2030, so it's it's still in development. So yeah, no, they, there's um Maybe a, a, a lot to go under the bridge. I think at the moment they they got some yeah. real issues with the the power to weight ratio of batteries, but fingers crossed they do it because it it revolutionised things. Yeah. Mr. Google tells me it's subsonic ultra green mm. aircraft research. <laughs> yeah. So what sugar stands for. Um, yeah. I think there's also a, uh, uh, to and beaver over in Canada. That there they, is. Uh, yep. fitted out with an electric engine. So that's yep. the one I'm aware of at the moment. Yeah. I got over to Vancouver um, about a week after that. And I was going to go and do a story on it, but the chief pilot, I couldn't um, tie up. He, he flew it at Vancouver. And there's a Cessna caravan about to fly with an electric engine too. Just need a really long power lead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks very much for your question, Lincoln. Thanks, um, Lincoln. Got a few more coming here. Um, so as I mentioned, if anybody else has any questions, certainly pop them up here. Uh, we've got two questions from Aiden, but he seems to have dropped off. If you're there, Aiden, pop, pop your hand up. Um, I can't see you in my, my little list here, unfortunately. Um, Aidan asks, are you going to write more books about aviation? Yes, I am. Um, I've got two in the works at the moment. 
One I started, uh, which is called the biplane, which is about uh, my Tiger Moth aeroplane that was recovered from an old shed as a wreck and restored and then flown. Um, and with the 747 days coming to a close, I'm thinking I'll probably do a book on the 747. I've done a small book on the 747, which is five or six different trips I did it, but I'm thinking I'll do a comprehensive book. So my aim seeing I'm stood down and not flying due to the pandemic is that hopefully this year I'll also write um, probably the biplane and another 747 book. That's the goal. We'll see. That's the goal. Yeah. <laughs> Always takes longer to write them than you. Uh, oh, it, it uh, does. And, and if I actually get a, a job or something in the interim, yeah. then I'll have to attend to that. Yeah. And Aidan also asks, what's the best part of your job? Um, I think one of the most enjoyable parts in recent years, when I first got into the airlines, like downwind at Cool and Gatta at 300 knots at 1500 feet, that's, that's a lot of fun going fast and low. But I think that when I was at Jetstar as a captain, um, and it sounds probably a bit corny, but mentoring some of the young pilots coming through, I, I really enjoyed having experience and being able to impart that on, on younger guys coming through be, and girls because people had done that to me. Yeah. I grew up around a father with 23,000 hours and 100 types. If I wanted to know anything about flying, I just walked into the kitchen. Yeah. Um, so to be able to do that, and I still, what, three days ago, one of the Jetstar FAs rang me up about something, asked me a question. So I'd have to say in recent times, it was, and, and this with Air League, it's putting back a little bit because um, for better or worse, you, you do accumulate experience. And, and as I get more dithery, I probably won't remember it all. So I'm try, it, I do find that satisfying. And in the airline world, flying with young first officers, I, I did find, um satisfying yeah and, and similarly you know seeing young early cadets go on to flying and uh you know some of our previous panelists like uh jeremy and uh tim you know they're both cadets and michael as well he was a, a a young cadet now he's uh instructing on hawks over in western australia it is yeah. certainly really uh uh really good uh, okay uh we've got um just four questions left. If anybody else has got any other questions, certainly pop them in now. Otherwise, um, we might just get to these four and then we might uh, call it an evening. So we've got Zane here. Uh, I think Zane's already asked one, but Zane, so you had another question. Uh, yeah. Where was your landing when you landed away from the airport? <laughs> uh, it was at a place called Canangra Walls. Have you heard of the Blue Mountains? Yeah. Uh, the Three Sisters, well, it's about, oh, I guess it probably was about 10 or so miles south of there. I remember giving the radio call and I was um, five, five miles on the Sydney 255 radial. So I, my magnetic bearing from Sydney Airport was 255 degrees, so nearly west, and 55 yeah. miles. So, But it was out near the Blue Mountains, out near yeah. um, Canangra Walls was the place. Right. I, got a free, I got a free helicopter ride home. <laughs> okay now we don't want to scare your mums and dads too much yeah. photos of the exploded cylinder head and the and the plane <laughs> uh doing it it's out landing uh, but owen does mention that in one of his books uh one of the 50 tales of flight books so uh you know put in uh for for your birthday uh you know um <laughs> or maybe maybe you'll get chosen as the lucky random winner for for tonight who'll get a a copy of a book and owen talks all about uh, that uh, outlanding and also the uh, the lessons learned uh, so forth on that and uh, they don't they do make a really good uh, uh, a really good read before Mr Zup even rejoined Air League you know I'd already sort of read all of the books too and uh, really enjoyed them as well so uh, you know maybe pop that one on your uh, Christmas mm -hmm. uh, or birth birthday wish list now we've got a, another question from Adam more around your book writing so we might bring Adam back up as well go ahead. Welcome back, Adam. Hey, um, how long did your um, 50 Tales of Flight book take to write? Uh, 50 Tales of Flight was a bit different from all my other books because I'd heard about these ebook things and didn't knew nothing about it. I, and I'd written probably at that stage, I don't know, 150 or 200 stories for aviation magazines. 
And I thought, I'll give this ebook thing a go. So I put 50 of my stories together. I didn't even put them in, in a logical order. I just put them together and had someone do a Photoshop cover. And I remember it was the week of the Avalon Air Show. It came out and I had to operate to... No, I think my wife was flying to Hawaii and I went on the flight with her. And when I got to Hawaii, it was number one on Amazon. Um, so I quickly went back and put them all in order. So it, it, it was really probably around five to 10 years of magazine stories that I compiled, uh, which I've subsequently gone back and put in a better order and redesigned the cover because it did far better than I thought. Um, but generally speaking, uh, I write at about a thousand words an hour. So uh, a book like, uh, well, uh, 50 Tales of Solo Flights, are, uh, say a 60,000 word book you're looking at 60 hours at the keyboard, but there's obviously research in that as well. So if you were to write three hours a day, you could probably get a, a, a book like that out in, in two to three months. But um, yeah, 50 Tales of Flight was, was a very happy accident. But I guess it just comes naturally if you're passionate about it. So a Absolutely. And I think that's a very key thing to writing is, is write as you think and as you feel. If you're, if you're writing nonfiction, solve somebody's problem. If you're writing um, fiction or something like that, try to have an emotional attachment and just, and people can see if you're bunging it on. So just, just write what you feel, I think. And, um, and that seems to be what connects with readers. If Do you have any sort of English degree or like writing? Uh, no, I have a master's degree in aviation management. My brother teaches or taught creative writing at university in America. And I said to him when this all started, I said, should I do a course in creative writing? And he said, no. He said, I have students who come in who at the end of their degree can structure a story, but they still can't tell a story. He said, you, you're a storyteller. He said, just keep writing and your writing will get better. Yeah, so well, thanks for that. If you're a bit of a storyteller, just, just start crunching that keyboard. Yeah, oh, good. thank you. Okay, good on you, Adam. Adam. Uh, we've also got Isaac back. Um, my second question was, what high school did you go to? I went to um, Newington College in Sydney. I, um, I went to uh, Guildford West Primary School. And then when I was in sixth class, I did all these scholarship tests. Um, and I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to go to Newington College in Sydney, which was a wonderful experience. And as I said, they had a, a cadet unit and air training corps unit. So we we had a lot of activities and a lot of facilities. We were very, very lucky. Very lucky. Yep. Okay, thank you, Isaac. Um, You're welcome. Thanks for your time. No, thank you, Isaac. Okay, we've just got a couple more questions from Paul here, a couple of good ones, so I might just bring him back. Um, yeah, go ahead. And we're just about through all of our questions, which has been a first, which has been good. I think it's good that everybody can sort of see the questions being asked so we can really... Yeah. Uh, work through them that way well. and also vote them up. So, uh, Paul, um, welcome back. Hi, Owen. Um, I'm going to be cheeky. I've got a couple of uh, quick questions for you. Yeah, go um, ahead, Paul. So you've got a lot of experience on the Boeing 747. Would you ever consider flying the 787 Dreamliner for Qantas or are there restricted spaces for them? Yeah, it, it's going to be a very interesting um, period now with the 74 retiring as to where we can and can't go. Uh, we'll need vacancies. At this stage, there's no Sydney base for the 787 crew. So one would have to commute to Brisbane, Melbourne or Perth if yeah. you want to take 787. Um, an A330 is probably a fairly logical step having flown the 320. Uh, but there's a part of me that um, uh, might see me even go back to the 73 to finish up the last five or 10 years just because I enjoyed flying the aeroplane. And, uh, and I could probably... We've got the simulators here, so I could probably get into training. And that's what I'd like to do. Oh, that'd be awesome. And also, does um, Hayden or any of your girls show any, uh, or go to Air League at all? Or do they show any interest in aviation like you followed in your footsteps with your father and mum? Yeah, uh, Hayden's obviously very keen. Um, he's involved in the Air League and uh, he sort of tails me around whenever I go, <laughs> go somewhere near a hangar. Um, the girls, uh, one of them may. Uh, it, I think she's sort of hovering at the moment. Um, 
but she hasn't made any real commitment in that direction. They're very heavily involved in sport. And I think that um, sort of takes up a lot of time with the schoolwork as well. But, but Hayden's definitely, um, definitely keen. And he's, like I said, he's always tagging behind me whenever I'm at the hangar or in an air show or something. So uh, oh, that's nice. Yeah. Well, I, I remember being my dad's shadow and it was great. Brilliant. We look forward to seeing your next Boeing 747 book because I enjoyed reading the, the shorter one that you did. That was awesome. Oh, that's great, Paul. Yeah, now this one will be a bit of a different book. That was a compilation of different flights I'd done and written about. This is actually going to be how I came to fly the 74 um, and the different places I went in that. And then the, the third section is going to be about this whole retirement process and getting them to Mojave and that. So it'll be a different book. Hopefully it'll have a bit of an emotional attachment to it too. Yeah, I bet it will be for you. A bit emotional at the moment as well. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, particularly because my wife and I both fly it, and we both aren't flying. So yeah, yeah but thanks right. for your interest, Paul, and thanks for your questions, mate. Good luck. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, we've got uh, John. Welcome back, John. I think you've already been up for one question already. Yes. Hello. Hello again. Hello, John. Um, yeah. Um, so my question um, was, what is your opinion on the new Boeing 777X and would you like to fly it? Yes, I'd love to fly a 777 uh, of any version of it. I think it's a fantastic aeroplane. Um, the developments had a few little hiccups along the way uh, and I, for the, the latest model. And I think um, this whole pandemic situation has sort of slowed down production lines even more. But um, I, I think it'd be a fantastic aircraft. And yeah, I'd love the opportunity to fly it. I don't think it'll happen. But once again, we don't know what's going to occur on the other side of this pandemic. International flying might change in ways we don't see and the, the 777X might be an ideal aeroplane. So never yeah. say never. I don't think I'll get the chance, but I, I'd, I'd fly any 777. I'd love the opportunity, but I don't think that'll happen. Sadly, yeah. Anyway, thank <laughs> you again. And also, th and and thank thank you to Mr. Grinter for putting on these um, webinars. I've been attending all of them. Yeah, he does a great job, doesn't he, John? Yeah. Not a problem. I'm I'm glad you enjoy them, and uh, they've been so popular. Even when we go back from COVID, uh, we're going to look to continue them as well. Mightn't be as frequent as every fortnight or every week, but we certainly do want to uh, to keep these going, mm -hmm. just because it's been great for uh, the cadets just to get a you know to hear from a, a wide variety of, of different speakers. You know, from uh, civil mm -hmm. aviation, military aviation. We've got a trip through the uh, uh, Central Fly School, which. Uh, broke zoom on us we had too many too many participants on there which was <laughs> good. so uh yeah we hope to, to get a few more um let's get to our last two now we've got jai yeah. back hello hello let's jai go. you had another question um yeah what um is the biggest airport that you have landed at through your career oh gee um sydney airport to go pretty close i think in terms of runway length uh Busiest airports, um, Los Angeles and Heathrow. And it's yeah, inter yeah. interesting because both of them are incredibly busy, but the style of air traffic control, uh, if you were in Los Angeles and you were told to turn and descend, they'd say, yeah, Qantas, we got you out there. At, uh, we got you coming over Seal Beach. Yeah, let her down now to 4,000, pull back to 180 and uh, make a left on a 240. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, if you're at Heathrow, they go, Send 4,000, left 240, speed 180 knots. Yeah. <laughs> like, same instruction, but totally different. So you can imagine how busy the radio is in one compared to the other. Um, so yeah. they're the two sort of busiest airports. Or the first time I went into Paris and the controllers speak to all the local people in French. So oh. you can't work. Someone's descending to 6,000. <laughs> and you have no idea where he is. So, yeah. um, to answer your question, runway length, probably, um, oh, I don't know if Boeing Field might have been even longer because they do some test flying out there. But probably Sydney's as long as anywhere, but I'd say Heathrow and Lax and went into New York once. Yeah, New York. Yeah. I came out on New Year's Eve after 9-11 and um, everyone had their lights turned off and they were telling us to follow the American 767. You couldn't see anyone. They were all in blackness. But yeah, wow. yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, I'll be very lucky. The more, these yeah. questions just remind me how lucky I'll be. Yeah. 
I do remember hearing once that Sydney was one of the designated emergency runways for the space shuttle, and if they had to abort a uh, trip to launch, uh, yep. they went in the outer space yet, they could actually land the space shuttle on Sydney Airport. Yeah. It would probably upset the airport too because it would shut down the airport for the rest of the day. Absolutely, but yeah. uh, I can imagine it would have been a, a fun hole for them, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, thanks, Jai, for that. And the last Thank one you. we've got here is Zane. Hi. Um, have you ever done any remote control flying? I've done a little bit. When I was about, excuse me, by the sounds of your age, I had a remote control glider. Um, and I, the first time I flew it, I remember I didn't know that you had to keep it in range and it <laughs> flew out of range on me. <laughs> um, but mainly I had control line back in those days. And mm. I was very lucky. One of the other Qantas pilots who lives near where I live took Hayden and I down to the local radio control airfield here, which is really close to us. And um, he had his radio control model. So it's something I'm sort of thinking I might give a bit of a crack at. Yeah. Although I can imagine I'd put all that work into building it and it did last five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I haven't done very much, Zane, but it looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Zane. Uh, great question. Um, I guess uh, drones is more the more popular. Yeah, more the game now. Um, yeah, uh, as opposed to, you know, when I was a cadet, it was all the control line and then, and then yeah. the radio control. Now it seems to be... Uh, uh, drones is, is, is the most popular and uh, I think there's actually work on getting an early drone workbook out as well so we can yeah. to start to apply some of that learning and uh, bring that on board as well. And, and then you start to get into some very interesting aerodynamics when you're trying to talk about lift and that. <laughs> is yeah. it thrust or is it lift? Yeah, okay, yeah. And we get uh, rotors going one way on one side and one way on the other. All right, Absolutely. we've got two more people with their hand up. I think it's uh, Elian, is it? Hello. Hello, Luke. Yes, Luke. Hello. Yes. Um, I am making a sand sled with my dad. Considering your work with aircraft, do you have any ideas or tips to make it as aerodynamic or as fast as possible? <laughs> I, I reckon if you just if you Google high speed aerofoils, you'll probably be pretty close to the mark in terms of shape. And the other force is drag, isn't it? So get it as smooth as you possibly can to reduce drag. So don't make it too good or you might lift off. That's the point. <laughs> You've got to come back down though. <laughs> You'll well, soon learn about flutter. <laughs> but um, yes, I would say look at high speed aerofoils, mimic those and then um, sand it to your heart's delight till it's as smooth as possible. Okay, thanks, Luke. And I think the last one we've got here is Eli. Thank you very much. No problem. I think Eli's got a sound problem here. Hmm. We've got a question in the chat. Who is the best person in your group? I'm not quite sure what that one is. If you'd like to type your question, Eli, if you're having some sound problem there. Um, we might take that one. Otherwise, uh, look, I'd like to thank everybody for coming on. I'd also like to thank Mr. Zup as well for coming on. Um, we've already had uh, Mrs. Zup's been on as well just now and uh, just had a... Uh, oh, I've lost it here already. Uh, there was a comment. Thank you, everyone, for the, for the wonderful question. So Mrs. Zup's been listening in the background as well, along with Aidan. And I'd like to thank uh, Owen as well for coming on. And, and as I mentioned, we're going to do a random draw. So of all the cadets, uh, sorry to the officers, but we'll, we'll do a random draw of all the cadets. We'll do a random draw and we'll get a copy out of uh, Mr. Zup's, uh, one of his more recent books signed for you. And uh, that'll be out and we'll, we'll post on, online who was the lucky winner. And we'll get a copy of that book out uh, as soon as possible. So thank you, everyone. I uh, hope you had a great evening. And uh, we'll advertise the next one online in the coming days. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.